Uh, okay, so for those of you that don't know me and are here for uh, Uncle Steve, I'm Ace I'm from Delta 2 Alpha. Uh, fitness and strength and all that's kind of a big part of what I've done for most of my life, I guess, in martial arts. And uh, I guess Steve, it's been a map for you too. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that don't know who Steve is, uh, if you've ever touched a kettlebell, uh, you're welcome. Um, Steve started out with a kung fu background, some of the turtle arts, uh, bagua, tai chi, singing, singing. Uh, and then was, was kind of one of the first guys running around with Pavel, one of the first senior RPCs back in the wild west of, uh, of kettlebells. So um, we'll go through and let uh, Steve introduce himself and we'll just kind of get the ball rolling. Like I said, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Uh, just try to hold at the end so I, I can make sure that we get to them. Thanks, Ace. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, so what's uh, what's going on? Tell, uh, tell them all about you because all the right. last one, the connection's horrible. So, uh, I'm Steve Cotter. Nice to meet you all uh, that, that are here. Thank you. And um, my expertise is in, in the movement. Martial arts has uh, been a very extensive part of my entire life. Um, I'm going to be 54 in about a month. I uh, started training. Uh, you know, my, I guess you could say formal training in martial arts and when I was 12 years old, back in 1982, with the internal Kung Fu, the Shingi, the Bagua, Tai Chi, Qigong, um, a lot of the Taoist meditations, and also studying the healing arts of Twina, use of herbal liniments. Um, so that was my first exposure to, to training. It, it provided me with a, um, definitely a outside the box thinking. Me being a, you know, born in the U.S., um, more of an Eastern philosophy approach. So I was studying Taoism and learning about meditation and contemplating uh, philosophy and my place in the world at a pretty young age. Um, so I moved out to San Diego back in '82. I was born in New York, and uh, you know, at that time when I was 12, my oldest two brothers convinced my mother to, to let me move out to California. They would uh, keep an eye on me. So I, I pretty much, from that time at uh, 12, I didn't have parental supervision, um, but I got immersed into the Kung Fu immediately. So that became sort of my surrogate family with my older brothers and my Kung Fu family. And um, that afforded me the opportunity to to basically train all day, every day, because I didn't have any responsibilities. And in fact, my first professional, my first uh, job was working, teaching Kung Fu at the uh, local rec center, teaching kids classes, starting when I was 15 years old, in 1985. And that became my full-time work uh, for at least the next decade, where I was essentially running a, a very successful Kung Fu school San Diego. Um, and in that, you know, really became uh, super fascinated by the fitness component. You know, at that time, it was just body weight work. Uh, it was well before kettlebells were on the scene. So just, so are we talking like the traditional stuff? Yeah, like, like fingertip, fingertip push-ups and, and knuckle push-ups. And we were doing chin and and, you know, pushing hands and you know, hitting the heavy bag and sparring, um, you know, a lot of one leg squats, what I'm sure call them the crane dip and kung fu, but the pistol squat, sure people know it as. Um, you know, so I was worked up to a really high level of fitness where I was literally training eight hours a day. And, you know, on my lunch breaks, I would run up and down the mountain, up and down, and, you know, um, teaching classes all day, but doing the work with the people. So I was doing, you know, probably a thousand push ups and, several hundred one-legged squats, you know, every show for, for many years. And that was my foundation. Uh, so at that age in my life, you know, still in my uh, mid-20s at this point, until about 1997, that was my full-time work. And then I had a change of direction where I, for the first time, thought, well, maybe I won't be teaching Kung Fu as my, you know, profession for the rest of my life. So now what am I going to uh, basically had a falling out with my Sifu at the time, you know, <laughs> so he was kind of the father figure at that time, you know, and it's like when a, when a boy, 
uh, has a mentor, and then you, you know you, you start to become a young man, and you, you see that well, this person is fallible. He's just a human. You know, he makes mistakes as well. And so your perspective changes. And you know, at that point, I was like, all right, I, I'm not going to be teaching kung fu as my profession. What am I going to do now? So at that point, I decided to go to school. I, I, I went to university a little bit later. I was 27, and I uh, basically studied, got my degree in kinesiology. Um, so that's when I first started looking. I had a lot of sort of practical and anecdotal experience through the martial art, and then I got more into the, you can say, the, the modern scientific viewpoint of fitness, which was very different, you know, and, and looking at VO2 max and body fat percentages and sure. And you know, different types of populations and what's appropriate or contraindicated. Uh, coming out of school at a uh, university in 2001, I was 31 years old. Right in that period, is kettlebells were brand new on the scene. Okay. And um, so I was one of the very first adapters. Uh, Pavel Satsaline and his uh, business partner, John McCain, with Dragon Door, they were really the first in the Western world to. Uh, create a program and to actually manufacture kettlebells. So I was one of the first adapters when I saw the kettlebells in this. Um, it was actually a martial art catalog called Vitalis. So I had been a customer for years and buy like DVDs on, on Qigong or these types of things. Sure. I started seeing these advertisements of, of this kettlebell and it, was, it looked really intriguing. Um, now prior to that, when I was like a, a late teenager, you know, I started going to the gym and doing just what was known at the time, which was pretty much of a bodybuilding, like, you know, look at the muscle and fitness magazine and okay, we're going to do curls and, you know, and, and um, you know, mentally looking at, okay, I want to be, I want to look good for the girls at that age. Right. But in terms of, uh, in terms of a martial artist, I never felt like that contributed to my efficacy to make me a better martial artist or a better fighter. You know, I, I got bigger and stronger in terms of the, you know, linear strength, but I didn't feel it made me a better martial artist. So, have you have you seen the the stone hawks, like the Chinese? Stone yeah, hawks? that was also the kettlebells. Yeah, absolutely. I, we we actually would make our own stone keys, our own stone locks, you know, flipping. And you know, so some people would compare that to sort of the Chinese version of a kettlebell, although the application is extremely different. The way that the way that I was uh, studying the, the stone keys, we would. We would swing it, but then we would flip it to develop that that short range or kind of flip it and catch it. So it was more similar to what we might call kettlebell juggling, okay. but obviously with the square shape, you know, it, it wasn't something you didn't really insert your hand or anything like you would with a kettlebell. So yeah, I did have that that experience with the stone key and um, a lot of the traditional Chinese martial art training. So I was even digging holes in my backyard and you know, putting on ankle weights and jumping out of the hole. And of course you can use a plyo box, <laughs> but it takes away all the hard work and the fun of digging a hole, right? That's part of the process that you dig a hole and you jump up onto the, Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of those types of traditional training, iron palm and you know, iron body and, and all these different types of weight lifting mm -hmm. uh, protocols. Uh, so 2001, I got involved with the kettlebell. And I uh, connected with Pavel, I guess it would have been 2002, uh, Pavel sat in San Diego for this, some kind of uh, strength challenge called the Tactical Strength Challenge. And I was one of the competitors there. So, you know, Pavel, uh, you know, made a mention, oh, you're, you're also very flexible. And um, so I was one of the, one of the winners of that event. And uh, so I got a, a complimentary, um, complimentary admission into the RKC that was coming up like a couple of months after that. So I flew out to St. Paul, Minnesota. And again, I was a second occasion to meet Pavel. Um, at, now at this point, although I was still pretty new to kettlebells, I had actually picked up the basic movements at that time, what was known at that time, which it's evolved immensely since then, but we're talking a little over 20 years ago. I was basically just following uh, Pablo had a DVD called the Russian Kettlebell Challenge. So I was, you know, learning the basic moves off of that. By the time I went to the RKC course in 2003, I had already been playing with the kettlebells for about a year on my own. And um, 
you know, I was pretty strong and pretty athletic, but most of that was from my Kung Fu background yeah. prior to that. So immediately Paul Bell was like, well, you, you, you're, uh, you know, you have the physical attributes, but you also know how to teach because I've been teaching Kung Fu for, again, at that point, 15 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, so I had an understanding of how to communicate, how to, how to lead people and how to break down movements. And so it was natural at that point uh, for me to be a kettlebell instructor. And so Paul said, I'd love for you to, you know, come back next, next course and be one of our senior instructors. You know, so that sort of began that. And I was with uh, Pablo and his organization for, for, I guess, about three years. Sure. Um, in that time, now, now another, it's not related to Kung Fu or, or to the kettlebells, but it is a significant kind of error in the fitness is uh, one of my very closest friends. Well, we, we didn't know each other at the time, but we've since become you know, very close friends. Uh, he invented the Bosu balance trainer, which is like that half ball, half ball. Sure. Almost every gym and every great physical practice. therapy. Yeah, you know, ab training, standing balance. There's a lot you can do with it. But um, so when he, when my friend David Weck was making this by hand, he was literally cutting Swiss balls in half and you know duct tape and stapling glue into a wooden platform so it was round on one side, flat on another. Well, that was hard. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and if eventually the manufacturing came a little bit after that. But when they were still being handmade, I was touring around the country with David, uh, going to all the big fitness shows. You know, Idea, Ursa, and Club Industry, and these other shows. Um, and just inviting people at the trade show, oh, come and try this and stand on it. Close your eyes and stand on one leg and do all these things. Um, so that was an area of, you know, Immersion, where for a couple of years I was really focused on training balance via the BOSU. And then the kettlebells came in a little bit after that, you know, a year or so after that. So when the kettlebells hit, I got really immersed in the kettlebells, training the kettlebells all the time, graduated school. And so, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go into personal training. You know, so I started, started doing personal training in San Diego. And I was, at that time, there was no kettlebells in any gyms. And the, the kettlebell, the way that it grew was very non-traditional. It didn't go into the sporting goods store like most products. It was an internet product. So the early adapters were people that were adapt at, at the internet, you know, uh, which was still pretty young at that time. I think it was before even YouTube, even, you know, YouTube, I think it was 2004. I remember. So, so I was literally bringing my own kettlebells to the gym to train my clients. The gyms didn't have kettlebells, you know. And uh, so uh, that continued a, a, a pretty monumental shift came about for me in 2005, where myself and seven other Americans, we formulated the first ever American team. And I was the first captain of the first American team. We, we sent a team of eight of us over to Moscow, Russia, uh, to compete as the American team in the Kettlebell World Championships. Just watched a bunch of kick late 80s action yeah. movies with Saul Plunger as the villain. So, yes, this was sort of, I mean, you know, I, it, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's also true. If you, if you talk about like the Cold War and you study history, which I'm a huge uh, student of history, they say that, you know, the Cold War, you know, the, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which was 93, was supposedly the end of the Cold War, but, the, but Literally, there was still a Cold War in terms of information. It lasted for at least another 20 years. Because even in the early days of kettlebell, like the, the, the Soviet Union had already dissolved, but there was no exchange of, of information in the kettlebell. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't find that out until I went to Russia in 2005. And I saw, now at this point, I had already started to build a, a name for myself and a following as one of the top kettlebell practitioners in the US and you know this the, the level at that time was like if you can do I was doing like 35 snatches each hand with a 32 kilo you know the traditional way you, you, you do your reps with one hand you switch hands without putting it down and I was doing like 35 each hand so 32 kilos is roughly 72 pounds for those of you that speak American exactly <laughs> yeah so 2.21 uh, pounds per kilo right yeah. And um, 
you know, so that, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm a smaller build guy, you know, I'm about 160. So um, for a guy my size, I was recognizing that, that guy's really strong and he's so small, you know, and so there was this kind of language that Pablo would use, like, oh, you're a mutant. If you can snatch 30 times, you can, you're a mutant, right? So having this um, background in the U.S. and being one of the top kettlebell lifters and then going to Moscow and seeing the best athletes in the world, that was an eye-opener. I saw guys that were in my same weight division that were doing like over 200 reps in, in, in a 10 minute time period. So in the kettlebell sport, it's 10 minutes and uh, the men compete with 32 kilos and the traditional lifts is double kettlebell jerk. So you have two bells overhead and that's 10 minutes. And if you stop or you put the kettlebell down, the set is terminated. So it's just one set and you can't put the kettlebells down. And then the second event is the snatch with one kettlebell. So you, you do as many as you can, and then you switch hands, but you can only switch hands one time. So you can't switch. So whenever your grip gets tired, you gotta keep fighting. And if I switch, I gotta finish on this hand. And once this hand gives out, now my set's determined I can't. So are you able to pause overhead? Yeah, so we have what we call the static. So the static position is where, in snatch, it's only here. That's the only part is when you, Fixate and boom, now you lock it out. That's your static. So you kind of slow your breathing. And now you can keep going, right? So, you know, there were guys doing, I, I did my best performance at that time with double jerks, so double 32 kilos. So 64 kilos was, was 60 reps, which was at that time an American record for my weight division. When I went to uh, Moscow, the champion that year did 155 jerks at the competition. I did 45 reps at the competition in Moscow. So, you know, these guys are doing almost four times the reps. And at first it was extremely uh, humbling because I came in, you know, in retrospect, I can say oh, I was cocky. I didn't feel that I was being cocky, but I had a certain expectation like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm Steve, I'm, you know, I'm known in the U.S. and I'm one of the top kettlebell guys, right? And then I go and I see these guys are just like levels, levels, levels beyond. There is a bit of a phenomenon in which in the United States you have the World Series, but only teams from America. Are yes, so you know, it comes, comes along with it, right? Absolutely. And I had the good fortune that through my kettlebell journeys, I, I was able to uh, travel to, and teach in more than 70 different countries around the world, uh, six different continents. And so, uh, Fortunately, I've had enough exposure to different cultures to not be so uh, <laughs> so brainwashed into thinking that, oh, my country is the best place in the world. You know, every place has their inherent positive and negative qualities. You but know? had you had that opportunity for exposure at that point? No, no, no I didn't. So um, first time you got to eat a exactly. eat roads. Exactly. Yeah. You know, my exposure was just more through the, the Chinese martial arts and the interest in that Eastern philosophy. But I didn't have that uh, experience of, of global travel and, and seeing a lot of different things in that. Uh, you know, so when I went there and I saw these people, it was like humbling. And uh, my first reaction was, I don't belong here. Like, these guys are way beyond my level. You know, and then um, it's a three day event. So then after, you know, after you get over that initial shock and disappointment, like, oh man, I embarrassed myself here. Um, then I started really thinking like, why, why are these people, how come these guys can do so much more work? Like, there's no way, you know, I've always been, you know, pound for pound, my, my strength to weight ratio has always been very high and I couldn't comprehend, like, there's no way this guy that is weighs the same as me can be three or four times stronger than me or, you know, three or four times more fit. And so I was like, how, how did it? And then I realized, well, it's the technique. The technique is so much more developed. And of course, the technique also contributes to the strength and conditioning because when you're moving in the correct way, you're using your body in a more mechanically efficient manner, you're going to get better output. So we're talking about hard style versus sport or hard style versus long. Yeah, so, so in terms of the, the language, you know, hard style was something really coined by Pavel it actually comes from the martial art because in the martial art, we have the quote unquote, the hard style and the soft style, right? Mm -hmm. And the hard style 
at least in principle, is based on you're going to kind of overpower, you know, like a Shogun Khan, where it's, I'm just going to have massive strength and boom, knock you out of the way. And, you know, and that has its limitation because it, it's limited by how big you are, how strong you are in your gauge, right? You're not going to sustain that over the course of the lifespan. Where the soft style in principle is based on, okay, I'm going to use more sensitivity, connect with that person's movement and, and redirect and use his force against him, mm -hmm. right? Sort of classic would be like a Shotokan would be a classic example of a karate that is more of a hard style and you have something like a Tai Chi or even an Aikido in the Japanese that's based more in the principle of a soft style. But again, all arts have both qualities and it's, you know, and so if we relate that to the Kerala, the hard style was really just a borrowed from the hard style martial art, where it's like they're trying to create maximal force and maximal tension in every movement. And that was the exposure, and that was what I was first learning through the, you know, Pavel system of the RKC, and I became a teacher in that system. Uh, but, but going to Russia, it opened my eyes that there's levels to this game. And this is a much higher level because at the end of the day, the the math is the is the true science because the numbers are the thing that that do not lie. The numbers tell the story, and it's like 155 reps is more than 45 reps. <laughs> Any way you want to slice it, I don't care how much effort or perceived effort you had to use. It's like if I'm working as hard as I can. It's like, I squeeze out five reps. I'm like, man, but that's, you know, I was using maximal force and this guy looks effortless and he does a hundred. He outworked me, right? And so I started looking at the numbers and realizing that more reps is more work. That's it, because it's reps times load is going to give you your work capacity. And then you divide that by how long it takes you, that's going to give you your power output. You're moving X number of kilos, yeah. X number of meters, right? Exactly. And that's something that's not based on your intuitive intuition or it's not based on how you feel or your perception of how tough the workout is. It's based on the amount of work that you actually did, which is a measurable quantity. Mm -hmm. And so in any case, Having that exposure opened my eyes to realize like, man, I don't really know what I thought I knew, or there's a lot that I do not know. And so I became really interested because uh, one of the great values that martial art has ingrained within me is the idea of being an eternal student. And there's always opportunities for growth and there's always opportunities for learning. You can be very, very skillful or even great in some capacity, but it doesn't mean that there's not something that, that cannot be improved. And it may deal with how you teach, how you communicate, um, you know, or it may be some other skill that's outside of your comfort zone that you've never been exposed to. In, in the martial arts, we see with it, uh, the contribution of, say, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, what that did to the, you know, where all of a sudden these guys that were great at striking, they had no answer for these guys on the ground and how, how now the game has evolved to where you have to know something about jiu-jitsu if you're going to be relevant in that game well you, you can go from a grandmaster to a white belt exactly it's an exactly you know but historically a lot of people don't know this but but uh chuck norris was one of the key instruments that helped to put the grace in jiu-jitsu on the mat because back in that time you know, chuck norris was a legitimate karate champion and he was you know still uh, in the LA, he was going to different schools and, you know, testing these guys out. And he had the opportunity to interact with some Gracies and they really humbled him. He had no answer for that. And so he was humble enough and, and great enough in, in his skill set and confident enough that he was like, I need to learn this. So right? anyone, like, if you look for it, you can find the video of Uncle Chuck at the Humble. Uh -huh. it's, it's on the internet. Uh -huh. I've seen it. And it's, it was I. Yes, he was. He's a Tang Sudo guy. Yeah, but yeah like, I mean, a great martial artist. Everything back then was like karate. Right? Mm -hmm. I think the karate Federation, the Tang Sudo guy. He actually has like I've seen a chain of martial arts like down like Mexico and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like or under his lineage, he's uh, legit. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, you take you take somebody that's never done it, off their feet, out of their world, 
Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so it's, 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 this illustrates that, you know, um, you can only master one skill at a time. And in the path of mastery, it's like there's almost a, a focus to where you're only focused on that thing. And it has its merits, but you also at some point have to get to the point where, okay, I, I've developed a certain amount of skill here, but I'm not strong here. And you need to be able to step outside of your comfort zone and get exposure to the discomfort and to the unknown. You know, and so as it relates to this, this kettlebell history, or my kettlebell history is Russia was that sort of, uh, that turning point for me where I realized, okay, I don't know what they're doing, but I know that I'm missing because I'm not doing what they're doing and, and I'm not there. And it took almost another decade until the Russians actually started opening up and sharing their their systems. Was it Valerie who was the first guy that kind of showed In the U.S., it was with Valerie Fedorenko was a, a really major significance. He was the first legitimate uh, Russian world champion coming out of the Soviet Union that had won, um, you know, won titles at the highest levels against the best athletes in the world. And he was living in the U.S., so he was the first guy that I was exposed to that was actually teaching the kettlebell sport and the techniques of the kettlebell sport from someone that was a high level performer in that, uh, which is very different than the hard style, you know. So the kettlebell sport, it's it, it's no it's power endurance. Um, the idea about the kettlebell, like in the in the Soviet sports system. It's not considered a heavy sport. The heavy sports is Olympic lifting, power lifting, and arm wrestling. That's the heavy sport. Kettles, kettlebell sport is an endurance sport. And it's specifically a power endurance because you have a, you know 10 minutes and it's as many reps as you can do without putting it down in that 10 minute. And so where the kettlebells has its place is it's a fixed weight. It's not like a barbell where you can slap more weight onto it. It weighs what it weighs. And, you know, now the market is developed to where you can buy kettlebells in two kilo increments. So you can start with like a 16 kilo and now you go to 18, 20, all the way up as heavy as you want to go. But traditionally, and even when I started with the kettlebell, it was only three weights. So it was 16 kilo 24 kilo and 32 kilo and that was traditional and then we came up with the, the 8 kilo and 12 kilo for women you know so you had 8 12 16 24 32 and then they started filling out the four kilo increments you know the 20 and the 28 and then in the last you know that less than a decade last five to ten years we start seeing companies selling two kilo increments great lakes Rebic. Okay. Yeah, Great Lakes. That's uh, Colin Lake. Yeah, he's up near the Canadian border. I think he's in Canada. He's in Canada. Canada. And yeah. he's got the, the, I think he calls them tweeners, which are in there. Yep. Right? Yeah. So we they, call them like the bridge weights. Yeah. yeah. So he doesn't do, I haven't seen him do cough ones. I've seen him do their like a traditional. Yeah, weapon. he does like more of a cast iron and, and he makes them also like really big. I've seen, um, I know he's got like a 92 kilo, which is like 200 pounds. Um, a little bit more, yeah. So, I don't know, I uh huh, yeah, and a gal, actually. Yeah, there's a, a buddy of mine owns a gym downtown San Diego. They have, you know, every every weight, yeah. kilo, 92 kilo, and you know, um, it's a great tool, but it's a little bit almost different than really kettlebell. That's almost like now we're doing powerlifting using a kettlebell, giant kettlebells, right? So, the, the kettlebell spore, it's a specific dimension. You know, with these bells here, these are the sport bells. Yep. And the thing about the sport bells is they're the same size and dimension regardless of the weight. So here's a 16 kilo, here's a 20 kilo, yep. where with the cast iron, these are the rubber coated, but with these cast iron, we have the, this like a 12 kilo, and this is 16 kilo. So you see that as they get heavier, they also get bigger. But the handles get fatter. So the, hang, the handles get fatter. The ball gets fatter. Yep. And so that actually, uh, in the kettlebell sport, you don't want the differences as you move up and down the weight. You want the precision because your hand's going to fit a specific way and the ball's going to sit 
specifically on your body in a certain way, mm-hmm. and you learn that position. And each per, each each body is a little different based on our levers. You know, we have thick, thin, tall, short, long arms, short arms. So you have to find the position that is mechanically efficient for your individual body. But once you find that position, now it's about maintaining that position because you're doing repeats. You're doing it as many as you can for 10 minutes. So you don't want any deviation in form. You want, you know, and so it's like, I use the analogy, if you, you know, a car is a car, right? Yeah. A kettlebell is a kettlebell. So if you're just going to go from, from home to the corner store, a Honda will get you there, you know, or a Kia will get you there, or a Porsche will get you there. But if you're going to race in the Formula One, you're not going to be driving the Honda or the Kia, right? You're going to be driving the fine precision machinery. And the same is true in sports, in all sports, you know, soccer or football, as they call it most of the world, it's a certain dimension. You know, you play in different countries or different cities, the ball is always the same. It's not going to be a different shape, you know. And so it took us time to really understand that in America. We were, we, you know, we were only in the last 25 years as kettlebell's been around. You know, so um, it kind of went backwards in the U.S. Because when Russia, when they first did the kettlebells, they were doing more of the classic bells. But as it got evolved and they started studying the science of, okay, how do the athletes respond under stress? And what's their breathing? What's their heart rate? What's the design? They tried many designs. And then they came up with ultimately what called the Odao, the, you know, from the Euro Mountains, the Odao design, which are these hollow bells here and then they fill that with different densities to make it heavier mm-hmm. and you know it has a 35 millimeter uh, mm-hmm. diameter in the handle there's a specific spacing here and they're all the same you know so that was actually an evolution mm-hmm. of so yeah there's a lot of differences you know the hard style um, it's great for fitness but from what I've seen over the last 20 plus years, you know, the most, the highest performing athletes are always going to be coming from the kettlebell sport because again, the numbers are telling the story. And a lot of times people will start with hard style because that's their first exposure. Maybe they do an internet search and they see, you know, strong first, they see RKC. So it's like, that's the one. And it's a great place to start. It's a great place to start. It's rudimentary. Um, it's starting with the basics. Mm-hmm. But if you're a kettlebell fanatic and you want to go deeper, at some point it's like, okay, I can lift this bell for five reps. I can do it for 10 reps. Can I do it for 30? Can I do it for 50? Can I do it for 100? Can I do it for 200? Right? Because again, it's a fixed weight. And if it's a fixed weight, if I do the same amount every time, I'm going to stay at the same level. So I either have to go heavier to elicit some overload or I have to do more reps mm-hmm. or I have to go faster to the same reps in less time, mm-hmm. right? So that's sort of the natural progression of the kettlebell is we understanding it's not a maximal load, the heaviest kettlebell I can lift once. It's a sub-maximal and I'm going to try to do it as many times as I can over a certain period of time. Okay. So we were talking earlier about uh, the expression I use is shoehorning, right? So we wind up seeing the kettlebell box up or the uh, club bell, which I got a, got a cool lesson on it uh, from uh, Louis Yao when I was down here. I actually just ordered three. Um, and so we see it with maces, we see all these things where it's like we start trying to make the tool do everything. So when we talk about like hard style, right? Like for me, the stuff that I do is I mess with Cleans predominantly with supinated pronated, um, but you snatches and but you mm-hmm. um, and I don't really bother with anything else. Uh, occasionally I'll be like a jerk or something like that. But when going through sort of look at it, when I made the, the joke earlier about the bosun ball, the great for bicep curls, when I start seeing things like the windmill and the kind of other stuff, is that something that existed in? The in the traditional kettlebell stuff. I mean, we all learned it. Yeah. Like for me, I don't find that I get the benefit from using that, using a kettlebell to do that versus, well, if I want to work over a press, I just do handstand push-ups in the depths. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we're talking about, you know, the origins and now, you know, historians will look at and say, oh, well, 
Kettlebells didn't really originate in Russia. The Greeks had a handheld weight that they used, and the Germans had a hand, and other cultures had a handheld weight. You know, the Scottish throw of something that's similar sort of to a kettlebell. I worked in a meat plant, and we had those Chinese stone monks. Uh -huh. They had steel versions of them, their weights on the scale. Yes. Right? And so, but the method sure. that people are using are, is the Russian kettlebell method because it's a style of training, it's a particular design of the weight, and it's a way, it's a, it's a rhythmic type of movement. So when you do a repetition clean, for example, a repetition snatch, that's unique or, or that style of training is really originating from the, the Russian culture. So based on that, I would say it's Russian kettlebell, it's not some other origin. So do we, in in the in the traditional Russian style, right? Yeah, you're not you're not seeing actually. You know, one one of my very close friends is a, is a guy named Dennis Vasiliev. He's a 13 time world champion kettlebell sport. Um, he's close to 40. You know, so he's I guess in the later part. He's still competing at a high level, but you know he's probably a little bit past his, his peak. True. Sure. Um, He's the lightest guy ever to do more than 100 reps of double long cycle with double 32. So long cycle is where you clean and jerk every rep. So it's a clean and a jerk and it's a 10 minute. And so with double 32s, he's done 101 reps and he's done 100 reps in competition. There's, I think, three other guys that have ever did 100, but he's... 85 kilogram. The other guys are all like over a hundred kilogram. Do they have like buckets to puke in? <laughs> they, no, the buckets are for the chalk. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I mean the work the work capacity is is super intense. You know, there's very few sports that will that will achieve that level of work capacity within that 10 minute period. Um, you know, and so uh, but. But Dennis, for example, he's one of the greatest, uh, you know, kettlebell sport athletes of all time. And, you know, those guys, those guys are not doing like Turkish get up. They're not doing windmills. They're doing fundamental, you know, they're doing swing as a conditioning for the grip. They're doing clean, jerk, snatch, and then they're doing squats. Now they're also doing other things. Are they doing a real squat or they're doing a real squat? They're, they're doing exactly. So they're either doing like jump squats where where they'll use a, a kettlebell and they'll do some version of a jump squat. Right, for conditioning. Okay. Um, or they're using barbell for heavy squat. So so for the strength training, they're using barbells. And, you know, with the kettlebells, and then the, the flexibility and the mobility is going to be separate. Might be stretching or, you know, some yoga type stuff. Sure. Um, what happened with the American development or the U.S. development with, with Pavel is basically a lot of filler was put in, what I would call filler, where we need to sell X DVD. Yeah, this type of thing, exactly, promoting the information products. And also it's like, if you're not really deeply knowledgeable about a technique, you need more techniques, <laughs> right? Because if you're a master, you can take one technique and you can spend the whole eight hours just dissecting that. And we can go deeper and deeper. But if you have a sort of a more of a superficial understanding, well, you know, maybe, maybe in an hour, we've talked about everything I know. So, what are we going to do the, the other seven hours? Well, we need these other movements too. So, you know, what happened with the Turkish get up in the window, actually, that, that was actually contributed by uh, Steve Maxwell, who was another one of the early adapters, one of the first senior RKCs. So not from Turkey? No, it actually came, Steve, Steve has a great sense of background in wrestling and jujitsu. And, you know, he had these old books, old wrestling books. And, you know, there was like, descriptions of pictures of these movements like the turkeys get up in the window right. and so steve's like oh wow cool they, they, these are you, you can do these movements and the kettlebells are very convenient way because it's got a handle you just put it there and now you 
you know, and so and Paul was like, oh, we're going to include that into the RKC program, sure. you know, and um, those are good exercises, but I think like the get up, that's more specific to to a, a wrestler, specifically to really a jiu-jitsu player where you're on your back and you want to get up onto your feet because, you know, because in jiu-jitsu, we have the stand up in base where you're, you're going from the ground. Technical get up, yeah. Yeah, you know, so the turkey's get up is just the, the, the kettlebell is representing if somebody is heavy on top of you, trying to get you flat, you need to hit escape and frame and now get up onto your feet. So it has a more of a martial art application, but in terms of let's build fundamental kettlebell skills, I'm not going to have you spend most of your learning in a get up. I'm going to have you learn how to press and then jerk and snatch and now you know how to stabilize the weight overhead you know and if you want to increase your overall movement capacity the get up's a great movement but traditionally it wasn't ever done with a kettlebell it's not to say that you can't do it with a kettlebell it's a great way to use it but people would do it with barbells sandbags human bodies so one of the I guess one of the questions I have, or kind of just thinking out loud, is uh, so I, I had a chance to work with a with Russian coach for about a year and a half learning ice run. I have a system called Scamp, so I can throw the ice and spikes and they actually fly straight like an arrow, like they do in the movies. Um, and to get to do that, um, there's a whole bunch of details. And so, just thinking out loud, how much of it is that we're creating these exercises to hold the attention span of Westerners? And I mean, like whether it's right. Western Europeans, Canadians, or Australians, where it's like, we could do eight hours on like all of the intricacies of this one movement, but people are gonna be bored and no one's gonna do it. And we just kind of, there's that desire to have, to go to the grocery store and have eight different types of apple chews from versus you get one, right? And so, I mean, there might be, might have been as much a marketing choice as it was anything else. I do think, you know, the, the consumerism that Western society in America most specifically, but Western societies in general is, is very much a consumer oriented. And I think that that does play into the need to present variety sure. and choices because, um, you know, I'm not sure the exact reason I think attention span. We have such a, a technological uh, influence in our culture and things are moving fast and there's always lights and tricks of the light. Mm-hmm. you know the phones and everything and so it's like it's very difficult for people to focus their mind for any extended period of time on just one thing mm-hmm. and it's that you know in the, in the martial arts the, the term I've heard is the monkey mind right. and it's always jumping around from sure. tree to tree and versus the meditative mind which is you're just being still and not thinking about anything in particular not thinking ideally I think that in the West, we definitely get, cult, uh, get taught in that, uh, a cult of the label, uh, the cult of the new, mm-hmm. right? So we just kind of see this thing and I, uh, like I had asked you about, you know, there's, there's clubs and races and I, and sandbag training and stuff like that. Well, I really enjoy that. And, you know, do you, do you continue to add that stuff or are we just can kind of continue to, okay, yes, and yes, and yes, and, or do we just kind of focus, right? Yeah. Um, and you'd said that the Cowboys kind of do the bulk of what you needed to do. That's your eight percent. Right. Because, um, you know, everything for me is viewed through the lens of martial art. Is um, The martial art is the most important thing. So in the last six years, you know, I, about six years ago, I got involved with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Great time. Um, a good friend of mine is one of the greatest of all time. Him and his brother, uh, Shanji Rivera. I've been friends with Shanji for you know, close to 20 years are through they, kettlebells. Are they in a... Sorry, well, Sean, I'm, I'm thinking Salo Rivera. Salo is his older brother. Okay, so university, Jiu Jitsu University. Yes, so that's where I started. Okay. Yeah, I started with, with Salo and Shanji. I knew Shanji for a long time before that because I was coaching him in kettlebells. Sure. But none of those years, you know, if I had started Jiu Jitsu when I first met Shanji, I'd been, been doing Jiu Jitsu for 20 years now. Sure. You know, but it took me, it, it took actually Salo I knew Shanti for a lot of years and I was training him at the University of Jiu-Jitsu. You know, he'd be like, hey coach, you know, uh, are you in town? And I'd be like, yeah. And he's like, I want to get a workout before New Year's. So, so it's like New Year's Eve, we're there. He's going to go out New Year's night. 
or New Year's Eve night, right? Yeah, and, uh, 2000. You know, let's get, let's get a workout in before. So I'm there, and then Solo shows up. He's like, hey! And I've never met Solo before, but he knew, I knew who he was. Right. He's famous in jujitsu, and he knew who I was through the kettlebell videos sure. and stuff. And so he's like, hey, you know, and he's like, why aren't you doing jujitsu? You know, Solo and Charlie are very different. Solo's like, he's a, just a killer, you know, he's like bulldog kind of guy. And He's like, he looks at me, he's like, why aren't you doing jujitsu? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, what do you say? Like, there's no answer, right? I don't so, think that I have a choice. I'm like, uh, yeah, so he hands me a gi. And, you know, and that was my first lesson. Yeah. And then I just, I fell in love with it. And, you know, a little bit after that, I got my son. At that time, he was 15. I'm like, hey, you want to do jujitsu? And he's like, yeah. And then that's when I got really serious when my son started. Sure. Because I was like, I was already, I guess when I started, I was 48. And, um, or just about to be 48. And, um, you know, it was like, I, I liked it, but it was like, oh, you know, I'm a little tired. I'll go tomorrow. But then when I got my 15 year old son, I was like, he's got to do it every day. Because I started martial arts when I was 12 and I did it every day. And one thing I know is that if you're going to be great at something, you have to do it. It has to be a part of your life. It's not, uh, oh, I'll do it, do it later. No, you got to do it today. And you yeah. gotta come back and keep doing it and do it over and over and over and over. And posted a quote know. yesterday from Dan Gable that it's important to do it every day. Exactly. Right. And so it was like he needs to train every day, so I'm gonna train every day because I have to be the proper example, you know. And then so it was really because of my because of Solo to get me into, it. and then it was my son that got me even deeper and keep me in it to where I still train every day now because it's you know it's just uh, be a beautiful thing. But anyway, the 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 jujitsu is what I care about and I maintain the kettlebell because I see the kettlebell as such a valuable complement to the jujitsu. Um, you know, and there, there can be different ideas and different opinions, and I guess depending on your style, but I'm of mind that skill is the primary uh determinant of your success, your your technical proficiency. The other part of that is your physical attributes. The skill is more crucial than the attributes. So in other words, someone can be a bigger, stronger, you know, more athletic person, but if they're going against someone that is far more technically proficient, they're never going to be able to beat that guy. It doesn't matter how big or how strong or how hard they try. Now, all things being equal, if you have comparable skill levels, now the physical attributes will contribute much more because yes, yeah, strength is important. Strength is definitely important. It has its role, but strength isn't going to overcome technique. Strength is not going to, superior strength is not going to overcome superior technique. Superior strength will overcome similar level technique, and now the superior strength is an advantage. So the, the kettlebell for what I'm interested in is perfect because it uh, doesn't beat my body up. I can train vigorously with the kettlebell, and then I can still train a couple hours after that and do jujitsu. Um, it doesn't hurt my body, it doesn't make me sore, it doesn't injure me, and it gives me plenty of conditioning for when I want to do competitions. You know, and I'm in the masters, of, you know, in your 50s, it's master five. So um, it gives me a big conditioning edge against guys in my same weight division you know, my same age. Um, and then there's the idea of framing because in kettlebells, you have to frame. You know, you're never, you're never going to be holding your arm disconnected from your body. Everything is always connected. And the same is true in, in martial arts and, you know, jujitsu specifically, but martial arts in general, the idea of your maintaining your frame. It's never a good idea to have your arm separate from your body in jujitsu. And it's also never a good idea for that in kettlebell. And so we start seeing the, how much they overlap the, the mechanical, uh, the mechanical use or the biomechanics in kettlebell transfers very directly and it develops really good habits, not reaching with your arms, but connecting. And, um, you know, so for me, I would rather do a few things as a, at, a, at as high a level as possible, then try to do many things and be 
you know, just sort of so-so at sure. a bunch of different things. But having said that, choose high value skills to become very good at, skills that have multiple applications. Yeah. So if it's jujitsu, it's self-defense. And okay, also there's a there's an outlet for my, you know, for my emotional, I can let the let the beast out of it, the animal side out, you know, or or for my competitive part, I can compete and try to beat this guy, you know, and, and not have to bring that into dealing with the civilization. I can be very peaceful and very zen like as I'm driving in traffic and you know, and I can be a complete vicious animal when I'm training with my school brothers or whatever, right? So finding that balance. One of the things that I, I would like to circle back to, so there's a, there's a buddy of mine I became very close with and I call him Angry Dave. Dave's like, he says he's five three, he's like, I pour pot five. He was running around like Frank and Ken Shannock and those guys back in the day. And he is pound for pound with the strong skills in there. Um, yeah, like this, you know, if you were to compete, probably, probably 35, maybe 45, if you're going to compete, but Debbie lives on a trap bar in five more points, right? And so there's a certain amount of, I, I think we start looking at that requisite, right? Like you have sufficient strength, mm -hmm. right? So you need to be strong enough and then technique. But from the other side of it, if you have somebody, like you see somebody pull over those kind of their ancient bill, their wrestler, and they have they have an incredible level of, of athleticism. Maybe that's in rugby. Look at a guy who comes over from rugby, mm -hmm. right? Has a huge gas tank, great physical attributes. Well, he might get smoked on his first day, but like within three months, he walks into another school and he's not gonna be getting caught with stupid shit. So like that guy is a white belt. But because of his physical attributes, he's able to really give blue belts a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you wind up looking at thing where it's like, okay, that guy's a purple belt, but he's also like, like he's just not strong. He doesn't have the attributes because he's too technique focused. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that you need to be strong enough. Therefore, you need it, right? So you need to be strong enough to get that. So to control your, your own body mass, ultimately. Even just like, like, so I've, I've done a deep dive into like grip training and hand training because I'm out in the middle of nowhere right now. So, um, you ever seen like the seizing bags? The seizing bags? Seizing bags. So like old school chin out. So I like uh -huh. bags, like different size bags. Where full of lens shot. And, yeah. yeah. So just take them, toss them up and just, uh -huh. right? And yeah. like just kind of flip them and catch them in different ways. Yeah. Like them, think a lot of finger. Rice bucket stuff. And yeah. like toss them around like a shot foot and stuff like that. So there's that yielding, but like, just being able to have that strength in the fingertips, that strength in the hands, and the ability to grab a hold of something, like you look at, um, like, so we call them club belts, but you look at, like, the old school karate, the hoju un belt, right? So karate comes from Okinawa, and not Japan, and the translation originally for karate was Chinese fist. So you see, like, the stone locks, you see the, they call them chishi, which is like a weight on the end of the stick. And so I think that there's a certain amount of, but the stuff that I do, the gym that I train, that's more of a Tetris and flavor. And so there's a certain amount of like, be able to just grab a hold of something, lock up and just bend it to your will. And then with a little bit of technique, so with the strength and conditioning, if it's superior and a guy may be like more technical, but he just can't budge you, right? Like we've all heard those tales of the carpenter stonemason comes in and it's like, I can't break his grip. Let's mm -hmm. break it like it doesn't work that way. So I, I think the tell bells are neat, right? Like yeah. the circuit and summation, pronation, just that ability, like whether it's circuit presses or whatever, just that ability to lock that bridge in the <laughs> positions. Yes. Uh, and then with the juggling, you start getting up the flowing, I think it's neat. One of the, one of the things that I enjoy about jujitsu, right? Like we all talk about the outlet for aggression, the creativity, and the problem solving. For me, it's the ability to stay calm under pressure. So, I get to work with guys that are at a very high level. And like the gym I'm at, my guys are fighting pro over in Japan. There's a guy in the UFC, right? All the places, it's the old band class, but it's guys in jail barracks and firefighters. Old man strength. Like, <laughs> the smallest guy is me. Uh, 200 pounds, uh, right? And they're just a bunch of monsters, but everyone has that old school kind of grit and strength. But I get my ass kicked there all the time. 
but I never stopped talking shit to them the entire time. There's a guy whose name's Mike Newton, and I just like kicks the ever living piss out of him all the time, and I fail to ever stop talking shit. And so I just think that there's that. That's the one component people never talk about with jujitsu. It's like, can you continue just talking shit when everything is going mm. so bad? You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that there's so many great athletes. Yeah, it. the the dealing with the pressure. You know, the, the saying "pressure makes diamonds." Yeah, and, and um, a lot of carryover into just interacting with uncomfortable situations. Well, can you can you be uncomfortable and not quit? Yes. Right? Can you right? Can you take that win or learn attitude? Right. And relationships. You know, uh, driving. <laughs> Yes, it's super important, and, I, and for that reason, um, you know, I'm a strong advocate of physical education. I believe physical education is the salvation. Um, we all know education is important, but there has to be physical education because if you're just uh, training your intellect without the physical education, there's a loss. There's no balance there. The physical education is it's the physical body, but in that, uh, we're dealing also with, with the emotional, uh, the, the emotional balance as well as our ability to focus, our ability to concentrate. So the physical education touches all aspects of the self. Um, and I don't, tr- I don't want the world to be run by intellectuals. It's not to say that you know, fitness people or, or martial artists cannot also be intellectual, but the, there has to be a component of the physicality to to the entire educational spectrum. So I'm a big proponent of children uh, being exposed as young as possible to the martial arts because for no other reason is it's presenting, uh, presenting them with uh, uncomfortable situations and pressure and and in a structured environment learning how to face difficult challenges and uncomfortable things and learn how to find grace within that and and deal with it without flipping out without losing your mind without going crazy you know and um, I'm much more comfortable in a room full of you know just absolute killers <laughs> than that I am in a room full of, you know, people that say all the nice things, but they've never really had their, their, you know, their butt to the fire where they had to, let's see how you react when, when someone's really squeezing you and maybe you're not such a nice guy after all, right? Maybe you're not so graceful under that type of pressure. So people that have that pressure testing day in, day out, it develops a, a, a certain amount of self-control that I don't think you can develop without that. We also, a lot of the, like the cultures that we look back to, whether it's the Greeks or the Romans, or we look at, you know, um, the Chinese or Taoism or right, um, Buddhism, all of those had a certain amount of physical culture involved with them, right? Like the, the monks of the Shaolin, right? There was the 72 exercises or whatever it is that they were, they were taught. Mm-hmm. And that was a part of that certain tradition, right? Um, Right, we go to look at the Greeks. There's a strong physical culture there. Yes, so you can still find go to like a park in China and find seventy year old people. Yeah, right, playing with the stone locks, mm-hmm. doing the Tai Chi. Yeah, right. Like there's, I found a video. It was the Chinese Minister of Health that was like in his early seventies, and he's doing like muscle ups and giants in the park, right? And so it's just like a giant for anyone who doesn't know, it's like spinning around with a hour, right? And then so you go and you look at that, and it's like. And so all the cultures that we look back on for wisdom were also like physical culture, strength culture is a big part of that, not just being a dummy, right? Yes, that integration of the mind, body, and breath. Absolutely. Yes. Um, before we kind of move on to something, how, like, just speaking generalities, how is it that the, the sports are, do you say long form or long cycle? cycle? So mm-hmm. long cycle, how is the long cycle movement differs in philosophy than hard cycle. Obviously there yeah, is. So, so I mean, if, if I were to do a, you know, hard, hard style per se, I'm going to try to have maximal tension and I'm going to, the breathing, very four, 
Okay. Whereas if I'm working more of a, you could say, kind of a sport where I'm working for a longer duration, I'm going to use only as much force as necessary to perform the task. I want to use my structure to support the weight so I have the static position where I can recover. And I want to be as relaxed as possible. So I'm not trying to use as much effort. I'm trying to use as little effort as possible and do more reps. Okay, so. So I'm going to be more active with the breathing because I'm constantly up, off letting versus tensing the breath and kind of compressing. I want to be more. So long cycle, do this one arm long cycle. We learn to recover in the static position, so I lock out the joint. Mm -hmm. Slow the heart rate when I need to for the breathing. Resting here when I need to. The catches look completely different and how you're receiving very it. relaxed here i'm not gripping super tense i don't want this tight because the forearm flexors are very strong but it's fast twitch and they're going to fatigue quickly yeah which means you can't once your grip is you can't hold it i want to be loose and just move the hand inside nice and so i'm really activating more of the finger flexors sure. which are more slower twitch endurance fibers so that's sort of the fundamental difference in the approach mm -hmm. where the heart style is I'm trying to use as much effort as possible. And so naturally you're not going to be able to do a lot of reps. It's like if you're driving fast, but you have a parking brake on okay. right? at the same time. So you want to stay super relaxed, but there's going to be tension, but it's just being able to alternate between tense, relaxed, tense rel versus maintaining tension the entire time. That would be kind of the fundamental difference in, in approach and what your values are in training. But at the end of the day, that's why I say focus on the, the, the numbers. It's a weight times the reps is going to give you the total work. So for the for the point of like Dell's app, get people to look at something like the the butterfly kick and pull up or, or something like that. Right. So yes, the volume goes up, but if you want to be able to start the power we're doing the same work. Yes, exactly. So, uh, rule of thumb, I mean, and again, over the lifespan, you have to think about if you're injuring yourself in your training, you, you're not going to be able to sustain that. So, the rule of thumb, and it took me a long time, you know, you don't think of these things when you're 20 years old necessarily. That's true. But um, if I can't be doing it when I'm in my 50s and 60s, then I don't need to be doing it when I'm in my teens and 20s and 30s. All right. So, um, you need to think about, you should be able to continue to do whatever the thing is that you like to do. You should be able to continue. It's not something that should just be age specific because if it's age specific, you're not going to be able to do it when you're older. And that's probably because you don't have the capacity because you injured yourself sure. in that chase for, you know, numbers or chase for weight or yeah. So having a, an eye on long term you know, longevity and sustainability is, is of the extreme importance in your overall health and wellness. Awesome. So, uh, just got a couple more questions for you. Uh, if anyone is in the comments and has any questions, feel free to put them in there. Um, how does your outlook on the kettlebell shifted from when you started until now? Uh, definitely uh, following, you know, my interests. Um, you know, in the last six years, the focus so much on jujitsu that now it's about how can the training complement the jujitsu. So it's much more dose specific. It's not just work out for the for the sake of working out. It's how can I get as much conditioning benefit in the shortest amount of time and not leave myself beat up so that I can train. You know, really with with full intensity. You know, on the mats later today. Um, and I've become much more interested in mobility as far as um, not having pain, not, not having stiffness or restrictions in movement. Um, 
you know, that one in your shoes sucks. Yeah. So not, not, you know, yeah, I'm chasing it. When I was starting a kettlebell, it was about, okay, I want to lift the heaviest kettlebell I can lift her, um, show how strong I am. Now it's more about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to use a weight that, that's comfortable, doesn't beat me up, mm -hmm. but I'm still getting a conditioning benefit and I can recover from that workout quickly so I can come back and, and train again later. How has your own personal training changed? Uh, like what, like does mobility and, and flexibility and stuff like that? Yeah, the mobility of the hips in particular, because that's so, so important in grappling, the ability to switch your hips, um, a lot more of a focus on sort of lifting the, the thorax out of the pelvis, you know, kind of creating that space here and having that mobility here to be able to move your hips freely. Um, that's been a big shift in the last several years of, uh, specifically hip and lower back mobility. Uh, yeah, not, not injuring myself. Not that I ever, ever really did injure myself too much, but just being, uh, really technique focused okay. of doing things, not being in a hurry to try to accomplish some metric, okay. but, uh, taking my time and really trying to understand, uh, the, the study of the, the skill that I'm learning or the, or the exercise, you know, exercise is a skill. It's a, it's a movement pattern. So what's the skill of that movement pattern versus, okay, I can clean this number of reps or this amount of weight. It's how, how, yeah, how can I efficiently get my body into that position? I like the point that you talked about, about like, if, like you have to keep your elbows in for that structure and stuff like that. And that I mean, whether it's really over boxing or, or I mean, fighting in general, but you want your elbows in. Yes. Um, and then as far as like mobility, are we looking at like a, like an animal flow or are we looking at the spot yoga? Uh, like, I'm doing a lot of, a lot of floor, um, you know, it's all, it's, you know, so even just joint mobility, standing, sure. you know, any, any types of joint mobility, uh, for, for all the major joints, but a lot of just, you know, a lot of just hip switching. Nice. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. A lot of hip switching and. Uh, the, the, these types of movements, okay. yeah, more ground-based movements, sure. yeah. So stuff that is very martial arts specific. Okay. And you, you have some stuff that's coming out on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I have uh, various. Uh, you know, I made a lot of DVDs in, in my time, but most people aren't using DVDs anymore. So more recently, I have some digital downloads. Mm -hmm. BJJ Fanatics, sure. so uh, kettlebells for jiu-jitsu, and you just go to BJJ Fanatics uh, website and you can type in my name and find that. Um, I have a mastery of the fundamentals of kettlebells, um, and then I, I just create four new ones that are going to be out over the next couple of months. Uh, all related to kettlebells, kettlebells and mobility. That's really my my forte and my expertise, and what I focus on is in. Uh, you know, kettlebell training, which the kettlebell provides the resistance. It's my preferred form of resistance. And then the mobility is your movement skill. So it's, you know, release, releasing stiffness, releasing pain, and uh, moving more freely, moving more skillfully. Excellent. And where is it being compiled more with you? Uh, so my website is IKFF dot com ikff dot com and then uh, you know mostly I'm more on Instagram okay. so it's just Steve Cotter ikff okay. on Instagram we'll make sure that uh, we all contact you guys are welcome to you know reach out anytime happy happy to interact and answer questions um, if you do wind up watching us on YouTube or you did wind up getting the kind of the first bit or whatever I will have all the contact info and everything for uh, for Steve and then if y'all watch the whole thing later on that's on YouTube it's a lot easier. I uh, will get that up in the next day or so. Great. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot, Ace. Thank you so Thank much, you guys.